Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us for day two. And also thank you for bearing with us uh, while we get some of these technical Zoom difficulties figured out. Um, inshallah, this is the Islamic psychology track, ethical considerations for clinical care. Uh, we have three presenters today, and then um, Dr. Khaled will be the discussant. So should you have any questions, please feel free to message him directly or message him in the chat. Um, and inshallah, we will get to those questions in the end. So each presenter will have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then the last 20, 25 minutes will be for uh, Q&A. So inshallah. Uh, Dr. Khaled, do you have anything to add? Um, do you want to introduce the uh, speaker? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone again. And personally, the topic of ethical considerations in clinical care is a very dear topic to my heart and one of my research interests. So I feel blessed and honored to be moderating the session. And I look forward to uh, hearing all the presentations. And I have so many questions myself that I look forward to getting answers uh, for, inshallah. So our first talk uh, is by uh, Professor Harold Koning. Uh, he's a familiar name uh, to many of us uh, who are interested in spirituality and health. So Professor Koning is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Senior uh, Fellow in the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development at Duke University uh, School of Medicine. His primary research is focused on studying the effects of religion and spirituality on health. He is the co-founder, uh, he is the founding co-director of Duke Center for Spirituality, Theology and Health. He is also the author of The Healing Power of Faith and 20 other books, as well as uh, numerous journal articles. So without further ado, uh, uh, we will we'll go ahead and, and uh, start the presentation with Professor Coney. Uh, I think it's, it's muted. Sorry about that. Hello, I'm Dr. Harold Koenig. I'm excited to be able to talk to you today uh, for 20 minutes on faithful practice of spiritually integrated mental health care in secular contexts. First of all, I'll talk a little bit, uh, give you a little bit more information about myself. Then I'm going to ask, answer the question, is bringing up spirituality or religion ethical in therapy? Next, we'll talk a little bit about the guidelines of the American Psychiatric Association, the Royal Society of Psychiatrists, and the World Psychiatric Association with regard to uh, addressing spirituality in clinical practice. Um, I'll talk about the mental health spiritual history and then review some Islamic-based religious psychotherapies and then provide you with some further resources. I will also briefly look at the research in this area so uh, to review that. So first of all, I'm a physician. I'm a professor of medicine and psychiatry at Duke University. My specific area of expertise is as a research scientist studying the relationship between religion, mental health, and medicine. And I've been doing this for about 35 years. I've written and published over 500 scientific peer review academic papers and have over 50 books on this subject. And uh, if uh, you look at the PowerPoint presentation, it uh, or the website uh, is up there, the link to the website. I am a Christian, a conservative Christian, but in many respects, I'm also a Muslim. I've worked with many Muslim investigators in Iran and Saudi Arabia. I just returned from Saudi Arabia, studying the relationship between Islamic beliefs and practices and a person's mental and physical health across a wide range of physical illnesses. Um, I seek personally, I seek every day to submit my life to the one and only God. And this is my motivation for everything that I do and say. 
just a slight uh, word on the relationship between Islam and Christianity. The Holy Quran says that Christians are closer to Muslims than any other religion that exists on the face of the earth. This is uh, from the Quran, um, chapter 5, verses 82 to 85. You, prophet, are sure to find the closest in affection towards the believers are those who say, we are Christians, for there are among them people devoted to learning and ascetics. These people are not given to arrogance, and when they listen to what has been sent down to the messenger, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears as they recognize the truth in it. Okay, oh Lord, we believe. So count us among the witnesses. Why should we not believe in God and the, in the truth that has come down to us when we long for our Lord to include us in the company of the righteous? For saying this, God has rewarded them with gardens graced with flowing streams, and there they will stay. That is the reward of those who do good. So now let's just talk a little bit about the medicine of the prophet in Islam. Uh, in chapter 50, verse 16, the Quran says, we created man, we know what his soul whispers to him. We are closer to him than his jugular vein. This is the beginning of health, real health and well-being. This verse expresses the idea that God is close, closer than even life itself, since the jugular vein represented life. God must come first before everything else. Then, only then, will true mental health be solved. If everybody could please mute themselves. Please mute yourselves. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. The best way for a person to experience good mental health is by developing a close connection with God and experiencing God's love, mercy, and practical help that he can provide as they submit, love, and serve him. We cannot ignore this as therapists responsible for caring for the people experiencing emotional illness and deep inner pain. How can we ignore this? Is it ethical to bring up religion or spirituality as part of secular uh, practice? Um, is it ethical? The answer is yes to both questions. I would argue that it is unethical to ignore this great potential source of healing based on what we know now from systematic research, including randomized controlled trials. I'm going to briefly review some of that now. Um, this review of the research encompasses a period from 1887 through 2019. Uh, the sources for this research come from the Handbook of Religion and Health, Health and Well-Being in Islamic Societies, Islam and Mental Health, Beliefs Research and Applications, and Religion and Mental Health Research and Clinical Applications. So those are the sources for the research I'm going to discuss. Depression, the most common emotional disorder in the world. Religious people experience less depression and faster recovery from depression in six, over 60% of the studies. Now, 6% show that religious people recover more slowly or are more depressed. In a recent um, systematic review, of prospective studies looking at religion, spirituality, and depression, uh, nearly 50% found that religious involvement predicts a more quicker recovery from depression or a lower incidence of depression. In other words, developing depression over time. That was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders in 2019. Um, if you're following the slides, uh, this is a JAMA Psychiatry article 
uh, titled uh, Neuroanatomical Correlates of Religiosity and Spirituality. So this is published in one of the top psychiatry journals of the world, if not the top. Uh, if you uh, look at the slide, you can see that among those at high risk for depression, because parents have depression, um, among those individuals, if you look at their structural MRI scans, that these individuals who say that religion is very important in their life have much less cortical thinning than do those who indicate that religion is not very important in their life. Suicide. 75% of studies show that religious people just don't commit suicide as often as those who don't have a faith tradition. Um, here's a set out of the uh, Harvard School of Public Health, um, and it shows that uh, this was among women. This was nearly 90,000 women who were prospectively followed for a period of uh, 14 years. They found that the rate of suicide among women who attended religious services at least once a week was actually 84% lower than the rate of suicide among those women who never attended religious services. Um, alcohol use, abuse of dependence, virtually all of the studies show that religious people just don't use as much alcohol or use it in a addictive way. The same applies to drug use. Um, again, 84% of studies show that religious people have, you know, are less likely to use drugs, illicit drugs, and even in uh, randomized controlled trials and experimental studies, virtually all report that, you know, religious interventions reduce drug use. With the and happiness, so not only is religious involvement related to less mental disease, it's also related to greater well-being and greater happiness and satisfaction with life. Um, there have been over 300 studies, and of those, 80% show that religious people are simply happier. They're more fulfilled in their life. Religious involvement even predicts mortality. I mean, not only is it good for your mental health, it's good for your physical health as well. So this is another study out of the Harvard School of Public Health, the leading public health you know, institution in the world. Um, again, 75, nearly 75,000 women prospectively followed for a period of uh, 16 years. This was published in JAMP Internal Medicine. Shows that those who are attending religious services once a week or more are uh, about a third less likely to die during the follow-up period. That's true not, uh, not only for all-cause mortality, but also for cardiovascular mortality in particular. And it also applies to cancer. So in this next slide, you can see that uh, that there are a lot of studies showing that religious involvement is related to better mental and better physical health. So given that, these are studies published in our peer-reviewed scientific psychiatry, psychology journals. Given that, how can we ignore this potential healing influence? I mean, is it ethical to ignore it? So conclusions from the research is that religious involvement is related to better mental health, better well-being, better social relationships, uh, healthier behaviors, and all of these, these aspects improve in a person's uh, life over time if they are religiously involved. The big concern is that as religion becomes less important in Western countries as a result of secularization, we're seeing crime rates, alcohol and drug use, and addiction rates all increasing. Religious involvement is related to better physical health as well. Less functional disability, greater longevity, less cognitive decline with aging. Those are some of the physical health benefits of religious involvement. These findings have huge implications for public health and health care costs as religion becomes less common 
with each younger generation, at least in Western societies. Clinical applications are enormous in terms of provision of mental health care services. So here are the uh, here are the guidelines for uh, a major psychiatric association on this next slide: APA, Royal College of Psychiatry, World Psychiatric Association. Each one of these guidelines promote or endorse that a spiritual history should be taken on every psychiatric patient. So, you know, if not only does data show that it's relevant, but these psychiatric associations are saying that we should be doing this. So why are we not doing it? Okay. So, um, you know, what are some clinical applications? The, the, the uh, biggest one has to do with taking the spiritual history. Um, the spiritual history engages the person about any religious or spiritual beliefs that they have, the importance of those beliefs in their life, and, and how they're related to what kinds of treatment they would prefer. Um, sometimes religious beliefs conflict with either psychotherapy or medication use, and so this all has to be explored, uh, as well as the role that religion plays in coping with the symptoms of, of mental illness. So mental health professionals have an opportunity to uh, to really support and boost the religious practices of the person uh, by, by saying, you know, by letting them know that these practices are overwhelmingly ordinarily healthy for a person's mental health. As we've been... I understand that some of you are getting a delay in the speed or in the presentation. Um, I believe that is because of his pre recorded video. Um, but I am going to pause it just for a few seconds and let's see if it catches up. And then inshallah, it'll, it'll be better. Talking about. At a minimum, though, all mental health professionals should respect patients' religious or spiritual beliefs or lack thereof. The second kind of application, well, actually, it's the third. The first is taking the spiritual history. The second is respecting the person's religious or spiritual beliefs or lack thereof. And the third is actually using religion in therapy to help treat emotional conditions. So there has been a comprehensive review of the research on integrating spirituality into clinical practice. And the slide here uh, shows you where that review is. This, this review uh, looks at effect sizes across the board for randomized controlled trials that, that have looked at the effectiveness of religious-based psychotherapies. Um, examples of those that, that my research group has been involved in is religiously integrated cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, for depression. We have Muslim therapist and patient workbooks from both the Shia and Sunni tradition available on our website for free download. Um, we are now working on religiously, spiritually integrated cognitive processing therapy, CPT, cognitive processing therapy, for moral injury in the setting of severe trauma. And we also have developed Muslim therapist and patient workbooks uh, for for that treatment, uh, we're, it, they're still currently in development. Though we've got a randomized controlled trial that that are actually testing uh, these interventions going on now at the Los Angeles Veterans Administration Hospital. Uh, further resources. I believe my time is just about up. Um, we have a free monthly e newsletter that I would encourage you to to sign up for. It's free. I spend a couple of days every month reviewing all of the research, summarizing it, commenting on it, and there are lots of resources that this e-newsletter uh, you know, includes. So, so it's free, sign up for it. There's our website uh, to do so. Um, there are two books that, that I've written on Islam and mental health. One is uh, Health and Well-Being in Islamic Society. That's probably the best one. 
that was co-authored with Saad al Shohai, who is a, um, a, a renal uh, a kidney specialist at uh, King Abdulaziz University. The second one is Islam and Mental Health Beliefs, Research, and Applications. So that's also co-authored by Dr. Uh, al Shohai. Okay, everyone, I will uh, drop the information um, for the speaker uh, in the chat box below for those of you looking to get his um, the access to his website, to his slides, all that will be uploaded to the WOVA app. Yes, and I will upload the name of the speaker. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Khalid, can we go ahead and introduce the next presenters, please? Thank you, Akhila. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koning. I think this was very uh, insightful in such a short presentation. You provided us with so many insights and, and rich evidence uh, on this topic. Uh, I look forward to further discussions uh, after the session. Uh, our next presenter, and to be honest, personally, just reading about reading their values and, and looking up their organization and their efforts has been a very inspirational, and I look forward to hearing from them. Uh, this next topic is titled uh, the journey. Sorry. The journey from service user uh, to advocate and uh, service provider. And our presenters are Sumaya Muhammad and Radia Salim. Uh, Sumaya is a certified peer support specialist who lives with schizophrenia and depression. She found her life's purpose, which is to hold the hope for others with similar struggles and walk together towards recovery. She is currently working at Club Heal, which uh, we will hear more about today, inshallah, where she is a program coordinator for our Healing Voice, which encourages peers in recovery to share their recovery stories and be peer mentors. She is also a proud mother to a beautiful daughter and enjoys writing, reading, and taking long walks. She will be presenting with Radia Salim, who is the founder and president of Club Heal, an institution, an institution of a public character that was formed in 2012 to help people with mental illness regain confidence in themselves and others in their journey towards community reintegration. Her past experience as a resident medical officer at the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore 2008, as well as her personal experience as a caregiver inspired her to form Club Heal. She is a family physician in private practice. Uh, so we'd like to welcome Sumaya and Radia. Uh, give them the floor. Thank you so much. They have a pre-recorded session, so I will share their share their uh, video now. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sumaya, and I'm from Club Heal, a social service agency in Singapore that supports, assists, and empowers people in recovery from mental health challenges. So in Club Heal, I play the part of a program coordinator as well as a peer support specialist. So yes, I'm also a person in recovery from mental health challenges. And um, this topic that I'm presenting, uh, also on behalf of Dr. Radia Salim, who is the president of Club Heal, uh, as well as one of the founding uh, founders of Club Heal. So the topic is mental health advocacy by peers, the journey from service user to advocate and service provider. So I think I've been on this journey myself. Um, I'm still a service user to, and but I'm also an advocate and also a service provider to others who are facing a similar journey. So yes. Um, the, the posters that you see on the screen are very close to my heart because um, the first one, it's okay to be you, be vulnerable, learn, share strength, is um, the poster that I um, that was on display during my course uh, uh, to be a certified peer support specialist. And um, that course was amazing because I, it felt so inspiring and empowering. And I, I wanted to bring that energy to Club Heal as well. Where, uh, to the program that I coordinate together with my team of um, two other peer support specialists called Our Healing Voice, where we similarly uh, build skills of the uh, peers in our program as well as give them opportunities to share their recovery stories and uh, give them platforms and opportunities to be a peer mentor to other peers in recovery. So the other two 
poses were done by the participants of the program that um, I'm involved in. Okay. So um, as um, um, this is my story. Uh, in 2018, I was involved in a nationwide campaign in Singapore uh, called Beyond the Label, spearheaded by the National Council of Social Services to um, eradicate this, to play our part in eradicating the stigma of mental health challenges, as well as to build conversations on uh, mental health issues. So um, they took a video of my story, and I'd just like to share it here. My name is Sumaya. Ten years ago, I put so much pressure on myself to excel in school that I ended up with a serious mental breakdown. Turns out, I have schizophrenia. It's common to hear heartbreaking stories about families who can't come to terms with a mental health diagnosis. But thank goodness, that wasn't my experience. I'm grateful for my family because from the moment I was warded, they poured so much love into me. What would have been a difficult time for most people turned out to be a blessing for me. Because my family did not stigmatize me, I did not internalize any shame. In fact, I felt empowered to finish my education and start working. Thanks to support and medication, today I lead a deeply fulfilling life. I married a loving man, and together we have a two-year-old daughter the absolute light of my life. Being her mother has made me an even stronger person, knowing that I need to be strong every day because this completely innocent and beautiful life looks up to me and depends on me, gives me encouragement. So, what am I thankful for? You tell me, because it's hard for me to choose. campaign in 2018 and I'm really grateful to be part of it and um, I really believe uh, that uh, peers can be um, peers should be on the forefront of tell uh, of advocating for mental health because um, it contributes to breaking the stigma you know because we um, are the evidence that recovery is real recovery is possible and it encourages people to seek help yeah, so um, when this, uh, after this video, uh, I felt really grateful when uh, two people came up to me personally to tell me that um, uh, they've reached out uh, for help because they saw this video. So that was really, um, uh, I felt grateful to know that it's uh, reached out to people and helped in a way. So, um, okay, so the, uh, the program that um, I'm in, uh, I helped to coordinate with the support of my team of, uh, so there are three peer support specialists in this program. We, uh, we have uh, a platform to increase the personal empowerment of peers to giving them skills to share their lived experience and gain experience in being a peer mentor to other clients. So there are five, part, um, five parts of the program. In the first part, there's uh, we identify uh, peers who are interested to be in this program. And uh, we have a, a mental health literacy program in the first part, followed by skills sessions, where we have topics such as building confidence, uh, self-care strategies, advocacy, healing through art, you know, and um, so on. Next, we will, everyone in the program will gain an experience to gain a platform to share their recovery journey in different platforms. So like in this picture here, uh, a few of them shared their recovery journeys in an art exhibition. So how, um, because these uh, peers were selected because art was healing for them and was a very major part of their recovery. So they, um, this art exhibition was organized by Club Heal. And um, yeah, so we included a, a, a program where they shared their recovery journey. Next, they will be um, uh, paired with another a buddy in Club Heal who they will mentor and uh, build a rapport with, as well as uh, guide them to, um, to, to together towards recovery. And finally, they will graduate. So it's a, a six-month program where we meet weekly. And um, 
uh, we, we collaborate with different uh, members of our staff, such as our counsellors and our art instructor, our health coach, and so on. And then uh, we've done uh, two runs, and, and now we're on our third run. And uh, total from the 2018 and 2019, we have 32. And this year, we have 30. So that's about 60 uh, peers that we have impacted. So I'd like to highlight a success story of my colleague, Sarina Said. She's, uh, she was once a service user of Club Hill. Uh, she had uh, a counselor in Club Hill and um, she participated in our rehab as well as the program of Healing Voice. And then um, slowly she began to feel very comfortable in Club Hill. She felt very happy. She wanted to give back. So she taught crocheting in, our re crocheting in rehab and as well as sharing her recovery story and was a strong advocate for, is a strong advocate for mental health. So for example, in this picture you see, she was the MC of the National Com Chess Award Ceremony. And she was, she's here being interviewed by the local newspaper uh, where she shared her story as well as her experience in Club Hill. Yeah. And now she's a, our program executive in the rehab program, helping many people uh, in, on their journey of recovery. So in Club Hill, um, through programs such as our Healing Voice, what, what we want to do is to um, empower our peers, uh, not just to be uh, service users, but to um, um, get their opinion, get their feedback, um, involve them in our services such that they become leaders in Club Hill. So they share their recovery story, um, they have decision making we employ them as as well yeah so uh, okay. uh, I wanted to share that uh, for me uh, the this uh, how this is relevant in the Islamic tradition is that it, um, well being up here finding the hikmah the meaning behind um, the difficulties, the struggles, was what really helped me finding finding my purpose. So um, through the program of our Healing Voice, through through working for Club Heal, I felt that I I can contribute in a way, and that the pain that I went through before, and the struggles that sometimes I still face, uh, it it is okay because I can give back, and so that's why I feel it's important to empower our peers and involve them in advocacy and. In, uh, in give them a greater say in our programs so that so that it really helps in their recovery and and they can really impact others as well because um, they have that deep empathy of knowing what it's like to go through mental health challenges so um, yeah so I, I would like to share that it's important to change the narrative of peers being stigmatized, um, uh, being helpless, passive victims, and change that into uh, people who have a lot of uh, competence in their recovery, who have a positive identity, and who have come up stronger and, and um, you know, like a butterfly out of a cocoon, you know? Okay. So in conclusion, in conclusion, peers can take charge of their recovery journey and support others to do so too. And uh, by sharing our lived experience, our recovery journey, we can break the stigma surrounding mental health and inspire people to step forward to get help. So uh, that's my sharing for today and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, for anyone who has questions for the speakers, please feel free to send them directly to um, Dr. Khalid, or you can send them um, just in the general group chat. Um, Saeed, are you here? I think I see you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, Khalid is going to introduce you, and then you can take it away.
Dr. Callahan. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Ustaz Saeed. Uh, uh, Ustaz Saeed and I met for the first time in Istanbul in 2018. We were taking a course together. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to meet him again today. Uh, Ustaz Saeed is a qualified integrative counselor and a clinical supervisor with proven experience supporting clients and supervisees in a variety of settings. His area of expertise are person-centered therapy, couple counseling, bereavement counseling, Islamic psychotherapy and supervision, and culturally sensitive approaches to counseling and supervision. He's a registered member of the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy. He's a fellow member of the International Association of Islamic Psychology. He studied Arabic and Islamic studies and works as a volunteer imam in his local masjid, leading prayers and delivering Friday khutbahs, as well as lectures and parenting classes. Uh, so I look forward to hearing this presentation. It usually takes two hours from Ustad Saeed to deliver this talk. So he, he's, he's going to do his best to squeeze it in 20 minutes, inshallah. Ustad Saeed. Uh, brother Khalid. Uh, good to be with you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, it is an honor to be with you uh, and to share this platform uh, with you all. Um, and I welcome you to sunny United Kingdom, inshallah, wherever you are in the world. And uh, welcome to my humble home and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he gathered us today, that he gathers us, gather, gather us in, in, in Jannah, inshallah, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In a beautiful narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he was yearning for his brothers when he was talking to his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his companions asked him the question. They said, oh, Prophet of Allah, we are your brothers. He said, no, you are my companions. But my brothers is those brothers and sisters is those who came after me. And they believed in me without seeing me. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the brothers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to follow his akhlaq and ethics, inshallah. So as Brother Khalid said, normally this talk takes a bit of time. So I'm really touched by the previous speakers and, and, and the story and what I'm going to do, maybe change it slightly and make it more experiential, inshallah, for the therapist. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation because I'm visually impaired and I don't use visual prompts. So inshallah, you will join me in a kind of reflection and active, um, an active, active listening, inshallah, that we can share in these kind of uh, brief minutes we have together. So when we're talking about ethics, and Islamic ethics in particular, Islam came to establish ethics and to establish conduct and righteous manners. Indeed, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, I, I only have been sent to perfect the best of manners and the best of ethics and noble conduct. So entirely you can see that the Prophet Sallallahu in his entire message came to reform ethics, conduct, and relationships. Indeed, when we look to our acts of worship, they have a social dimension, a spiritual dimension, and a relationship dimension. So when you look at the salah, for example, the prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Indeed, prayer forbid immorality and evil. And when you look at the fasting, the main objective of, on the principle of, of fasting and the, the aim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for, to those who came before you. So you might attain taqwa, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at zakah, the aim of zakah is to cleanse and purify. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, take from their wealth, sadaqah, to cleanse them and to purify them. When we look at the concept of hajj, concept of hajj is simplification of human unity, of equality, and also detaching ourselves from the worldly things and focusing on what is our purpose on this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created us and is the one who sent the book for us and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we can fulfill our duty and our 
role on this earth as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intended for us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you are on the best of, of akhlaq and ethics and manners, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Aisha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was asked about the manners of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ethics and akhlaq, she said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ Indeed, his conduct, his behavior, his ethics were the Qur'an. So the Prophet sallallahu manifested the Qur'an in his actions, in his behavior, in his relationships, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he is the best example for us. When we define ethics, ethics are defined as the study of the, stand, of, of the rules, standards, and the principles that govern the conduct of a society and they are agreed by that society. When we think about Islamic ethics, we need to think about them slightly differently. Because firstly, we need to ask ourselves some questions. What is the ultimate good that one should strive for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created us for a particular purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ Indeed, I have only created man and jinn except worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a solemn oath from us before we, he created us and before we existed on this earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَدْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمْ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِمْ طُهُورِهِمْ وَأَشْهَدْهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ So Allah took a solemn oath from the children of Adam and from their offspring and he said to them am I not your Lord and all of us said yes so this is the fitrah that we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all of us upon to worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to carry out his act his commandments on this earth so the ultimate good that one should strive for is to fulfill their purpose and the purpose, the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them for. So secondly, what are the sources of Islamic ethics? The sources of Islamic ethics are the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of, and the hadith of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know the sunnah, they, you know, the sunnah is divided into three categories. They are the signs of the Prophet ﷺ, the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, and also what he did not change during his lifetime ﷺ. So these are the sources of our ethics as Muslims, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Who has the right to sanction ethics? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his book and through the Prophet ﷺ. Because he's, as we said, he's the one who created us and he's no, the one who knows what is best for us. And he's the one who sent the light to us through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finally, what motivates the individual to do good? Our motivation is seeking the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and seeking eternal happiness in this dunya, inshallah, and the hereafter. And we know that this dunya is a transition for the hereafter. So our purpose is to do good on this earth and to fulfill the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels when he created Adam, before he created Adam, I will create, I am جَاعِلٌ, I will create a khalifa, a custodian on the earth. So we are the custodians to look after the earth and to practice in the best possible way and that's why we need ethics and akhlaq. So why are, why are ethics important for the Muslim therapist? Well, as previously said by other speakers yesterday and today, we faced multiplicity of challenges and complexity. And when we look to implement the Islamic paradigm, we have to take our sources from the Quran and Sunnah, 
in order for us to orientate our clients and ourselves toward the fitrah, the prim, pr primordial nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us upon. So how do we create that receptive ability in ourselves? And I'm not going to talk about the self now, and because a lot of panelists have spoken about it before, what is how we create that receptive ability within ourselves as therapists before we can create it in our clients. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned three principles and he also mentioned how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to make dua and he was the he was the one Allah described on the best of manners and ethics and akhlaq. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to say Allahumma ahdini li ahsan al-akhlaq or Allah guide me to the best of akhlaq. Only you can guide to the best of akhlaq and ethics. So Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned there are three principles that we need to create in ourselves in order for us to be ethical and to be competently ethical in our conduct and behavior and manners. So he said the first thing that you have to be of a kind disposition, a kind and gentle disposition, meaning that you have to be kind and merciful and that's how the Prophet Sallallahu was. When Allah described him, indeed we have sent you as a mercy for the whole of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talked about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he captured the heart of his companions and how they were surrounding him and gathered around him by loving him and connecting with him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this in a beautiful ayah in Surah Al-Imran, Surah ch chapter 3, verse 159. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, min Allahi Indeed, with Allah's mercy and compassion, you have become gentle and lenient toward them in your dealings with them, meaning his companions. And indeed, if you were harsh or hard, hard-hearted, they would have walked away from you, they would have dispersed from you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa forgive them and make and ask Allah to forgive them and consult with them. And when you make a decision, depend on Allah. Allah loves those who depend on him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and this verse this verse was revealed during the and after the Battle of Uhud when the, the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba disobeyed the orders of the Prophet and the archers did not stay where the Prophet asked them to stay. So you can imagine on a human level, you know, if, it, if, it, if, it, if this was us, we would feel, you know, upset or angry. But the Prophet felt that compassion and kindness and he consulted with them he spoke to them, he asked Allah to forgive them, and he forgave them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why the Sahaba had the connection to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you have mercy, you have connection. And when you have connection, you have togetherness and collaboration. When mercy is taken from, from something or taken from, from any a human being, then you have disconnection. And you have friction and, dis, and, and people disperse from you and around you. So this is how the Prophet Sallallahu was described. And this is his mercy Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first thing is to have a gentle and a kind disposition. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Aisha, Ya Aisha, when Allah, when, when, when the rift, when compassion and gentleness is put in something, it makes it beautiful. And when it's taken from something, it makes it harsh. And then Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said the second thing is you have to have a strong will to maintain the ethical competency, those akhlaq. In order for, or for all of us to have strong will, we have to, our soul has to be strong. In order for us to reject our desires, our sometimes self-interest that conflict with our ethics. So having a strong will and a strong soul is a prerequisite to have Islamic ethics. And then thirdly, Ibn al-Qayyim said that 
The third thing is to, or the third principle is to have the ability to discern between what is right and what is wrong, what is beneficial and what is not. And that comes with a lot of wisdom, with knowledge, with practice. So in terms of our ethics, we can talk about the principles and the high objectives of Sharia, which are you know, the five legal objectives, you know, to protection of life, the protection of nafs, the protection of the intellect, you know, the protection of religion, and the protection of property. And then we come to the values of Sharia. The values of Sharia, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, the values are mercy, justice, welfare, and wisdom. And we don't have enough time to go to each one of them and to show examples from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet But I want to move very quickly to four hadiths that we can implement in our lives. And these four hadiths are the principles of all akhlaq, of all Islamic manners and ethics. And Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani rahimahullah was a fam fa famous Maliki scholar and he was known at his, during his time as Malik al zaghir the little Malik. He said, if you have these four hadith, then, and you practice them, you understand them, then you have all the hadith that talk about manners and akhlaq and ethics, and there are so many of them. So the first hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحبه لأخيه ما يحبه لنفسه. So he said, none of you will believe until you love for your brother or your sister what you love for yourself. So this is, deals with matters of the heart and the purification of the heart. And these, this hadith demonstrate how Islamic ethics can be a light and a source of purification for the heart. When you love for your brother or, you love, or your sister or you love for yourself. So imagine having that hadith in our therapy sessions when our clients come in, come in and we want the best for them to protect their interest, to give them and to give them the warmth and the love and the compassion that we want for ourselves. Secondly, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever believes in Allah and the day of judgment, let him say something of good or remain silent. So this hadith also for us has so many implications, but in therapy, for example, when we look Sometimes if when we say things, are they, these things in the best interest of clients? Or is it our own ego sometimes, or our own kind of curiosity? So, and also how we deal with things that are only relevant to what we're doing with the clients in the session. And this is very important. Number three, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, من حسن إسلام المر تركه ما لا يعني Indeed from the best Islam, of a Muslim is to leave matters with, which don't concern him or her. And that's very important also in therapy. Sometimes when clients come, they are vulnerable. We also have a duty and responsibility to protect them, protect them spiritually, ethically, and in every other way. And part of that protection, sometimes when we doing things or looking for past events, for example, with trauma, you know, we might have the, the, the curiosity to look to the past. But if the past is harmful, then we don't need to go there. We need to stabilize the client and look after their welfare and their well-being. And also sometimes we have to be very careful about our own curiosity and ask ourselves the question, is our own curiosity for the benefit of ourselves or the benefit of, of our clients? And then number four, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a beautiful hadith to the man who asked him for advice, he said, do not be angry, meaning that the one who is in control of his emotions and regulates, body regulates, emotionally regulates, is the one who's going to be successful. So when we teach our clients to mirror these four hadith, how do we regulate ourselves and look, take care of ourselves as a therapist, especially in the current climate and the pandemic? and all the demands that are put on therapists is how do we regulate our emotions and take care of ourselves so we are 
in a state of emotional regulation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a beautiful hadith and he explained this when they asked him about who are the best of people and the best of people are those who are at people's service who offer services to people he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam the most beloved to people most beloved to allah are those people which are which are useful to other human beings meaning they are at the service of other human beings and he illustrated that ethics and morality are from the Iman. When they asked him who are the best believers, he said, Ahasinuhum akhlaqa, those were the best ethics and manners and conduct. So for us, in terms of our ethics and how we go forward in purifying ourselves and our hearts. I will finish here with a beautiful hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they asked him, the Sahaba asked him, O Prophet of Allah, who are the best of people? And he said, the best of people are the one with a truthful tongue and a clean and pure and a swept heart. So they said, we understand what is a truthful tongue. But what are the person with a pure, clean and swept heart? And he said, Saduqul Lisan, the one who has a truthful tongue and has a mahmoom qalb. Mahmoom al qalb meaning the one who has a pure heart, a clean and a swept heart. And mahmoom means that in your home, when you have things that you clean and you sweep away, then you purify your home. Similarly with the heart, the heart needs to be purified and cleansed. And then the Prophet ﷺ described it. He said, the one who has taqwa consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taqwa is very important is the measuring tool that we measure ourselves with in 1985 Patrick Casement described the process of the internal supervisor he wrote a book he's a psychoanalyst in, in the UK and he wrote a book called unlearning from the patient and in this book he coined the phrase the internal supervisor and subhanallah when I came across this term I understood even more what taqwa meant. And taqwa is that conscious ability, that conscious awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's that watchful word that you have and Allah's presence, Allah's, you, you, you conceptualize Allah's presence in our lives and then we deal with things that we face accordingly. And that's very important because taqwa is that ability to always have Allah's presence in our life, even in a therapeutic room with the client and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and to guide us when we feel stuck or when the client feels stuck. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Whoever is conscious of Allah, Allah will always find a way out for him or her. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, التَّقِي النَّقِي The one who has taqwa, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who has that purity and cleanliness of the heart. الذي ليس في قلبه the one who doesn't possess in their heart sin or transgression or hatred or jealousy. So this hadith illustrates that how important it is for us to focus on our the purity of ourselves and the purity of our hearts in order in order for us to become ethical. And as the scholars yesterday mentioned the verse. In, surah, in chapter 91, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّهَ Indeed, he is successful, the one who purifies him or herself. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَاهَا And he has failed, the one who cropped his or herself. So Islamic ethics are purifying and transformative for the nafs. And they are enlightening and purifying for the heart and islamic ethics are guiding and maintaining for the apple and the intellect and we remember as the prophet ﷺ said I, hope, I only have been sent to perfect the best of manners so the message of the prophet ﷺ entirely was to promote good akhlaq good ethics 
And sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best example, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, he is the role model. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed in Allah and his messenger, you have the best example, the best role model, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to start with ourselves in our pursuit of Islamic ethics. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ Om, you who believe, protect yourselves and your families. And the best demonstration of our ethics is to start them, to demonstrate them with ourselves and our families. The Prophet وسلم, said, And this is why the Sahaba, the companion, companions, may Allah be pleased with them, when they asked, they asked, the, they asked about the manners of the Prophet and his akhlaq and ethics, they asked his wife Aisha, because it's very important for our ethics to be transparent, to be practiced, we have to practice them with ourselves first, with our families, with those people around us, and then we practice the adab in our relationship and the akhlaq and the ethics with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, we take with ourselves by developing ourselves in the right way through the Islamic paradigm. When we're thinking about the Islamic paradigm, we're talking about the philosophy, talking about the theory, talking about the practice, talking about understanding our history, as Dr. Rania illustrated yesterday and others and also the synthesis in terms of how we bring all these things together. So that's very important that we do that for ourselves in order for us to be effective in our client work and to demonstrate the best for our clients, inshallah. We still have time, Brother Khaled, just checking. Uh, you are just on time, uh, Seth Saeed. You're just on time, so we can start the discussion and take some questions if that's okay with you. In, in, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair for listening. And if there's any goodness in what I have said, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if there's anything I have said and it's not of benefit or wrong, then it's, it is from myself and the shaitan. I ask Allah to forgive me for that. And also forgive me for any shortcomings. And Jazakumullah khair. And may Allah reward you for listening. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who benefit from the knowledge and those who their knowledge become beneficial and witness for them, not against them. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much, Ustaz Saeed. I really appreciate this, uh, these beautiful reminders about the personal ethics of the therapist, uh, integrating some of the teachings from the Quran and the Sunnah in, in our clinical practice. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sumaya and, and Radia. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this many times, but I have to say that it was very inspiring to see the courage uh, in sharing your personal story uh, and to encourage others. You, you didn't only do this for yourself, but you also are building a community of peer support. Uh, Professor uh, Koning is here with us as well. Everyone is going to join us for the discussion. Uh, Professor Koning has walked us through integrating spirituality in clinical practice, whether it's ethical or not. Some of the codes from APA and other professional bodies regarding this integration. And he offered us some uh, resources and suggestions I think he is here with us now, and, and many people have requested to share some links and uh, also to share the presentation, which was not played during the presentation. So we hope to get access to the uh, presentation later on. Uh, but for now, we've received some questions. Uh, I wonder uh, if uh, Akila, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, is the, the Professor Kowning, Sumaya Radia, and Ustaz Saeed are with us? Uh, Correct. Everybody is here. Um, you can go ahead and um, whichever questions there are, um, you can go ahead and start us off. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Koning, thank you so much for, for joining us live. Uh, I have a couple of questions here that we received. Uh, first question here comes uh, from one of the audience. It says, there's an inevitable conflict with the ACA's non-discrimination clause pertaining to marital partnership status as a protected class. If, for example, a same-sex couple were to enter the counseling service for marriage counseling, a Muslim counselor would be obligated to do marital counseling with the couple and could not refer them to another provider based on principle, according to the current ACA Code of Ethics. This is the American Counseling Association. If the Muslim counselor were to agree to see them for counseling, 
the counselor will be in a position of direct support to a relationship that is impermissible according to Islamic law. How should Muslim therapists navigate these matters? Should Muslims refrain from being licensed altogether or work towards changing the code of ethics? A very, very <laughs> important question. And I would, I would think, well, I, I would certainly hope that efforts could be made to help to change the APA uh, guidelines in that regard, although uh, there, those efforts will probably not succeed in this current era. Therefore, I think the best way to deal with a situation such as that would be to refer the couple to someone who would be more comfortable um, counseling uh, same-sex couples. I, I think that's basically your, your only alternative is to gracefully explain that, uh, that you know, that, that, that you're just not a good fit for the couple and that, uh, that you have someone who is particularly skilled in, in, in addressing the issues that the couple are likely to, to be dealing with and you would like to refer the couple to that individual. I would, I would not make a big deal about the fact that you don't counsel same-sex couples. I would, I would instead very gracefully explain that, and, and all of that is true, what I said, you know, I, it's true that there might be somebody else who is more familiar with the same-sex couple issues that, that would be better uh, for that couple. So, so that, I, I would think that would be professionally quite appropriate. If you don't mind, just a follow-up to this, Professor Counting. Uh, some counselors, especially, uh, who are, have to abide by the ACA Code of Ethics, and, and based on the question here, it seems like you know, referring based on, uh, on this might not be appropriate. They say we have to gain competence in areas we are not competent in, like this is one of the, one of the ACA Code of, Codes of Ethics. So, so how to address this? Because he says here, and could not refer them based on the ACA Code of Ethics. Yeah, if you can't if you can't refer them, and your religious beliefs prohibit you from seeing the couple, um, then you just have to, you know, what's first in your life. I don't know any other way to answer that question, but it's uh, I, it's a question that that many people are now facing, and uh, they respond in various ways. That's a very powerful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the next question is someone asked, I'm very interested in uh, the manuals for Islamically Oriented CBT and CPT. Can we get the links to those manuals and the website? Is there a documented history of cognitive theory among Muslim practitioners? Also, I'm already a CBT and CPT provider. Do you recommend additional training to be able to deliver CBT or CPT from an Islamic framework? or is it self-explanatory in the manuals? Yeah, if, if you have, if anyone has interest in, in any of the manuals for the CBT or for the moral injury, the Muslim versions of the manuals, uh, just send me an email and I'm happy to send it to you. My email is herald.konig at duke.edu. Also, if you have any questions about my presentation, uh, the Whova app, I tried to install it, but I'm too old for that. And I guess <laughs> I, I couldn't figure it out. So just send me an email if you have any questions about my presentation, or if you want any of the manuals for either CBT for depression or, a CB, or, or cognitive processing therapy, for moral injury in the setting of PTSD, just send me an email, harold.koenig at duke.edu. That's so kind of you, thank you so much. One last question here I see for you, Dr. Koenig is, how do you bring the spirituality part in CPT? Well, you know, um, we do it based upon the holy scriptures of the religious faith tradition. So in Islam, we are basing it entirely on the Quran and on the hadith. So, uh, you know, we, we, take a, we take a CPT framework, cognitive processing therapy framework, and then 
we take the, the beliefs based on the Holy Scriptures and we integrate those into the therapy so that it can help people to, you know, to deal with the, with the moral injury, with the, with the guilt, with the shame, with the self-condemnation, with, with the difficulty forgiving, with the religious struggles. So we, it, it's really perfect. It's really perfect. The, the Islamic scriptures address all of these issues. They have for over a thousand years. Uh, we have only recently in psychology made them all secular. <laughs> and my feeling is that it's, it'll work a whole lot better if we just use those original teachings that are so powerful, that are so integrated in people's lives. That, that's, that, that's a very beautiful answer. Very well said. Thank you so much. I hope this answers these two questions. I have received a question for uh, Sumaya and Radia, if they can comment on what are some of sorry, the Sorry, Dr. Khaled, could I interrupt you for a second? I'm so sorry. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Corning, I just have a, um, I sent you a message. Uh, would it be possible to email me your PowerPoint presentation? Oh, sure. I'm happy to send you a PDF of the PowerPoint. Just send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to send it to you. Okay, wonderful. I will send you an email. And for all those listening, um, as soon as I get that PowerPoint uh, PDF presentation, I will go ahead and share it. Um, I will go ahead and share it um, on the app. Thank you very much. Dr. Khaled, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, this is a question for Sumaya and, and Radia. Uh, what are some of the uh, challenges you encounter uh, during your uh, peer support program? Uh, also, a follow-up to it has come as many chronic mental illnesses are relapsing and recurring by nature. And when they do occur, they could affect our functioning and thus the functioning of peers in the program. Have you encountered any challenges regarding this? Uh, okay. So uh, some of the challenges uh, do include uh, our peers uh, falling, uh, having a step back uh, where they uh, fall a little bit unwell again. And um, what we do is we, we, we connect with their counselors and we provide kind of a holistic support to know that we are still here, we are still waiting for them as they recover, and that the program is still open for them to rejoin. Uh, so, um, because we do believe they, that they can recover, they're just having a step back, you know. Um, I prefer the word step back than relapse, because relapse kind of has that very negative, uh, that you're, all, all you did is gonna, is, is, is kind of it's like it's it's not as, as as positive. So, yeah, I we 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 kind of have that um, welcome back whenever you're ready to join us again. And uh, yeah, other challenges in the program is that the program is quite long, so sometimes attendance can be an issue because it's a six month program. So we try to engage them in um, we try to try really hard to engage them by checking in on them uh, and providing that uh, support that they can talk to us whenever. Uh, they face any issues. Yeah. Thank you so Go. much for uh, correcting our use of the word. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, thank you so Sorry. much. Radia, Radia, uh, you want to say, you want to add something? Uh, I, don't, I don't have anything to add, but yeah, mm -hmm. at Club Hill, yeah, we try as much as possible to engage all the peers. Uh, in fact, um, uh, at, at least one third of our staff are persons in recovery. And uh, so we continue to support them as best as we can. But the important thing about this program is that uh, it's not only an advocacy program, but uh, the, the service users in turn become mentors to other service users. So we see a multiplier effect to, of this program. And uh, it's very empowering for the peers because they are not made to feel just like uh, service users. The, we emphasize that everyone has got something to contribute and they have strengths. So we are about recovery. So it's very much strength-based uh, person-centered and person-directed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sadaradi, for this uh, addition. 
I have a question for Ustad Saeed, uh, if you can uh, hear us. The question says, does Islamic theory of akhlaq consists the concept of talent? Does Islamic theory of akhlaq consists the concept of talent? Mm -hmm. it, it does, because Islam came to refine and came to promote excellence in everything we do. So, subhanAllah, one of the things we didn't have time, but you know, we could explore the concept of ihsan. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, Allah has written ihsan upon everything. So when we do things, we try to do the best of our ability. But also the process of self-refining and self-transformation is that development, that personal development of the self. And is a gradual development to ensure that the self achieves the best objectives that the self can and the, and the human being can on this earth. So the, the talent is, is so integral that we, you know, our, you know, the verse, the first verse of the Quran that was revealed, it was Iqra, read. And that kind of recognition of knowledge and talent in whatever talent comes, you know, that our abilities, our skills should be promoted and recognized. And that's how, as human beings, we should always be in that process of continuous development and that's what islam wants us to do is to be ethical in our pursuit of knowledge and, and and talent and to make sure that we do things that will serve us and maintain us in this life and and the life of the hereafter so it's almost you know the prophet ﷺ said you know to give us the ability to strive and to move forward he said if the day of judgment comes and there's a, a branch of a tree in your hand plant it so he gave us that ability. So you can imagine the day of judgment just coming and everything is happening and the world is turning upside down. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you have a, a branch of a tree in your hand and, and a sapling of a tree and you, you need to plant it, plant it. And you can plant it. So it's almost that kind of illustrated that when we have knowledge and talent, we need to nurture it, look after it, develop it, and also be grateful to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that he's the one who granted it granted us that goodness and that talent and use it in the right way that Allah wants us to do. Thank you so much, Mr. Said. Uh, uh, Professor Koenig, if, if you don't mind a question here, uh, where do we draw the boundary between integrating spirituality and imposing our own values in therapy? Where do we draw the boundary between integrating spirituality and imposing our own values? Okay, very good question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think, I think we inevitably lose to some degree our own values in, in, uh, in psychotherapy, no matter, no matter how we try not to. So to some extent, you know, uh, that, is, that, is, that is natural, that is normal. Uh, people who are atheists, psychotherapists, do the same thing. Um, you know, they impose their values to some extent on the patients by the way they respond, they react um, to the patient. Um, so so in, in many respects, I don't think it's really possible to completely, um, you know, not, not influence our therapy by our own values and morals. Um, now, um, having said that, I do think, I mean, the only thing that you can really do uh, ethically, I think, I think here, is that you respect and honor the beliefs and practices of the patient. Now, now that, that, that is with regard to their religious beliefs and practices. Um, and I, I, just, I don't know how else to do it. Uh, as, as, uh, as Dr. Nasser was saying earlier, um, you know, you to, to love people, love others as yourself. <laughs> and how would, how would you as the patient want to be treated? Uh, uh, how would you as the patient want to be treated? And that is the way you are to, to, treat, um, to treat your patients. Um, but like I said, you know, if you have very high values, strong religious beliefs, I think, I think that is trem of tremendous value in helping people to get through very difficult circumstances. And, and in some respects, if, 
I, I guess if you do it with kindness, even your morals and your values will come across as something good. Because when you do it in a loving way, it's it's difficult for patients not to receive it. It's it's only if you if you do it in a in a harsh or condemning way that 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 patients will be offended and will reject it. That's that's a, a very very good answer. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. There's a question for Ustad Said. Uh, can you elaborate more? Uh, on the internal supervisor you mentioned, and you mentioned a refer you referenced a book or research related to this. Could you repeat the information about the research and the book on the subject, please? I think you are muted, Ustad Said. Can, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so the, the internal supervisor was first coined by uh, the British author, uh, Patrick Caseman, C-A-S-E-M-E-N-T. Uh, and he wrote a book called the uh, on learning from the patient and uh, in this book he coined the term the internal supervisor and subhanallah when we think about our islamic ethics then that comes from our process of taqwa so the concept of taqwa is the consciousness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through that you develop a sense of muhasaba which is personal responsibility and self accountability uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is watching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who wants us to do the right things, you know, by people uh, and to do the right things by ourselves and to do the right things. So these are, this is the ability to have that self accountability and self supervision. So before is a pre kind of conscious awareness. So before you enter to anything or you, before you, you know, in Islam, we know the concept of niyya, for example, that we, when we intend to do something, we do it and we make sure that this action or this behavior or this anything that we do is based on two principles. You know, firstly, is about having sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of God, that we do everything, you know, to please God. And secondly, we have, you know, the action has to, co how to be reconcilable with the Quran and Sunnah. So anything that we do has to be reconcilable with the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet So it's almost that ability to be deliberate, is that ability to have intention and attention to everything we do, whether it's in private or in public, whether it's with an individual or with a group of people, whether it's with ourselves or with others. So it's that self-regulation that comes from taqwa and that's what the internal supervisor is that you ha we all of us have this internal process that we conceptualize in terms of what we do why we do it and how we're going to do it and also what will be the outcome and that will determine our actions and our thoughts before we even think about the action thank you so much sorry i think i have what, just last two very brief questions and then we can close the session if that's okay Akhila. A quick question to uh, uh, Said, where do we draw the line when a person is expressing an area of duress or regret and is narrating a sin? How do we as Islamic therapists know where to stop them without falling into the problem of giving the person a space to expose their sin? I think you, you just go with, you, you leave the accountability to the client and if the client wants to go there, you you know, we, it's important to that we allow them, give them the space, because that's also part of their healing process. So we don't want to make the client feel guilty about this. And also, we know Islamically that, you know, the concept of Tawbah, so repentance is very important. And, the con you know, if uh, Professor Rajid Skinner was here, he will say Tawbah is the gold dust, you know, because Tawbah in therapy is so powerful, you allow them to attach and connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give them the hope whatever sins they have committed, that Allah will forgive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most compassionate, most merciful, if only we seek the path to earn his forgiveness and earn, you know, uh, the tawbah, his repentance. So I would always focus on the hope and focus on the ability to give the, the client that ability to, to think that whatever is done in the past, they're not captive to their sins in the past, but they still can have the ability to refine and modify what they have done and leave the, that behind. And we know one of the dua of the Prophet وسلم, he used to ask Allah for good ending, for husn al-khatimah. So it's not to be 
consumed by what has gone to the detriment of what we have left is to focus on what we have and what we have in the present and, 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 and to work on that rather than to be consumed by the past. And we can use the concept that the past is a place of reference, but not, is not a place of residence. Thank you, Seth Said. One very quick question, last question to Professor Koenig. Uh, would Muslim therapists consider branching or learning more about clinical pastoral education as a way to bring spirituality uh, as the basics of cha chaplaincy functioning? It honors our own spirituality and respects the client's belief system. Uh, so would you encourage Muslim therapists to consider clinical pastoral education? I would. Uh, especially if there's a great interest in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in this area. It, it's interesting that the question should be asked because uh, we have actually developed a chaplain intervention for moral injury, uh, a Muslim chaplain intervention for moral injury, which I'd be, I'd be happy to share with you if, if you would like. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, sending also the chaplain <laughs> Muslim intervention along with the participant um, uh, part of the intervention, the participant workbook to anyone who sends me an email who, who wants the SICPT uh, uh, manual for addressing moral injury. But yes, I, I would agree totally. Uh, pastoral education um, uh, it's a wonderful thing to get and to have the combined degrees in, in CPE as well as, you know, your counseling or psychology degree, that, that's a wonderful combination. I think they fit beautifully together. Thank you. You've been very generous with us today with your resources and references and we look forward to <laughs> get all of these links, inshallah. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Koning. I'd like to thank uh, Sumaya and Radia and Isad Said for joining us today and for the beautiful presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in a future Islamic psychology session uh, in the conference. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. We're going to take um, just a 15 minute break. Let the other two tracks catch up because alhamdulillah we didn't have as many technical difficulties as they did. So I'm going to call that a win for us. Um, so go ahead and take a 15 minute break and I will see you all back here um, in 15 minutes, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Akila. Thank you very much.